introduce uh, Professor Tiana Uchaz. Tiana is a historian of early modern art and craft technology with a focus on Northern European and Netherlandish art. She's an assistant professor in the newly created School of Performance, Visualization and Fine Arts at Texas A&M University. Um, in her research, she asks questions about art media and materials, skilled making, the sensory experiences of artists and viewers and ways of knowing in early modern culture. And I am especially thrilled to introduce Tiana because uh, she was a postdoc um, for three and a half years in the Making and Knowing Project, our wonderful team member who I have missed ever since. And um, she has gone on to great things. And I'm very much looking forward to this new research of hers on fertile hybrids, material transformations, and workshop secrets. Please welcome Tiana. Thank you so much, Pamela, and to Linda and to Hermann for this wonderful invitation and the opportunity to kind of reflect on connections between um, our work as art historians and the biosciences. Uh, my talk today will proceed in five parts, so um, those will be signaled in the slides, so you're able to have a couple anchors about where we are along the way. But I want to start with um, an overview of some of the kinds of theories and issues around generation hybridity and monstrosity that were swirling around in the mid 16th century. Um, and it will not surprise you to find out that much of it goes back to um, the authorities figures uh, of classical antiquity, namely Aristotle. And in this passage here, we see not only references to um, sexual reproduction, but also to the spontaneous generation that um, we heard a little bit about yesterday in um, a few of the talks. The idea that certain types of animals um, and, and fungi um, and other, we'll say, low life creatures could actually arise spontaneously from putrefied material. And here are just two contemporary illustrations of these particular types of generation, um, which you'll see, it'll come back around, I promise, <laughs> will be relevant later in the talk. Um, but let's also shift to think about um, if those were normative types of generation, there were also abnormal um, types of human generation at least. And I'm um, showing you images that are taken from a later English translation of a 16th century work, I think published um, 1573, if I recall correctly, by Amboise Paré. Um, and these pieces are taken uh, from his actual uh, treatise on monsters and prodigies. And one of the things that he does is try to account for monstrous births. And so he did this um, in a number of ways. Uh, one was that there might be a, um, a deficiency of seed and that could actually cause um, a, a loss uh, or a lack of particular types of limbs, um, as we see here on the left. Um, or there might be a, a superfluity of seed, in which case you might get um, not only additional limbs, but um, depending on the proportion between male and female seed, you might end up with a hermaphrodite. Um, or twins were also thought to, to come from this type of um, uh, defect of seed. Uh, there was also a consideration of the way that the gestation took place over the course of pregnancy within the mother's womb. And so monstrous images could be imprinted upon the child and lead to birth deformities. So there's um, a case reported by Paré of a, a white man who has a white wife who gives birth to a black child. And the explanation for this was that at the moment of conception, she was uh, concentrating on an image of an Ethiopian. Um, there are also acknowledgement of hereditary diseases. Um, there's acknowledgement of potential injury to the, the mother during um, pregnancy that might result in um, birth defects, as well as things like a narrow womb. And actually, speaking of the narrow womb, let's look a, a little bit about what our Paré says, because he draws a really interesting parallel here to um, craft practice and comparing um, the forming of metals and fusible things of which statues being made do less express the things they be made for if the molds or forms into which the matter is poured be rough, scabrous, too straight, or otherwise faulty. So there's this idea of this investiture of, um, you know, of a, a, this 
the hylomorphism that um, Rebecca was talking about yesterday, that's kind of marrying, marrying of form and matter. And there was, um, there were ideal ways for that to happen and then deviations from. Now, um, there were also monsters of the confusion of seeds of diverse kinds. And so we see here um, some famous examples um, of the pig monk or the calf monk, <laughs> poor monastic men, they were always um, called out for being hybrid or being the progenitors of hybrid animals. But there was a recognition that not only um, uh, uh, the sexual practices and um, as well as uh, kind of um, copulation throughout the animal world was not necessarily species exclusive. And that could lead in cases to hybrids, um, whether ones that were actually recognized as true hybrids, that is uh, fertile hybrids, um, such as the elk or the giraffe was thought to be a fertile hybrid, a hybrid in that case between a camel and a leopard. Um, and part of what could, was thought to be able to generate a true hybrid, according to Aristotle, was that you needed two animals of roughly the same size. So of course a mouse could not make a true hybrid with an elephant, for instance. Um, they should have the same length of pregnancy um, and they should be closely related species. And then those three uh, criteria were extended by early modern zoologists uh, to include similar seasons of fertility and parent species that must be extraordinarily horny. Now, this could also, of course, lead to um, fantastic composite monsters. And in, um, some of these were reported uh, in Pliny and other ancient authorities and were uh, carried over into uh, early modern zoological texts as there was an attempt to classify the orders of nature, um, such as the uh, Martacora, which is a combination of a, a human, a lion, and uh, with a scorpion's tail, but also um, using notions of hybridity to explain some of the animals that are found in the New World, such as the Sioux that features here on the title page of Conrad Gessner's Tierbuch, um, which um, is thought to be a lion and a man and a squirrel hybrid, but was perhaps inspired by a species of opossum. All that to say, notions of hybridity were current in scientific culture, but they were also important to artistic culture. And we're now going to shift to a story that begins when a young boy was walking around Rome in the 1490s and fell down a hole. And he fell into uh, what he thought was a cave, a grotto. And uh, when he was found, what it was discovered to be was actually the remnants of Nero's uh, golden uh, Domus Aurea, his golden palace, which was covered inside with um, ancient Roman frescoes of a particular ornamental style um, that came to be known as grotesques because of their origins in this kind of early modern grotto space. And so I'm just giving you a little detail here on the left, but to show you that actually this grotesque style was a kind of hybrid of plant and animal forms, um, things that blended into one another, the, there were notions of generation, you can see there's a, a kind of trajectory to some of the, the ornamental forms. Um, here's another view, um, I want to point out that it's not just um, organic, uh, things that we would think of as organic materials that take part or participate in grotesques, but also things like musical instruments, here's a lyre. So it's a very um, uh, generative uh, type style of ornamentation. And the Domus Aurea became almost a site of artistic pilgrimage for young artists. Um, and many of them graffitied the space with the equivalent of Tiana was here. Um, and here we're seeing the graffito of Giovanni da Udine, one of Raphael's um, assistants or students who actually helped then to decorate the um, the Vatican, uh, some of the, the Vatican loggia with grotesque ornaments that were inspired by antiquity, but then were actually of uh, designs that were coming right out of workshop practice in the early 16th century. And so the grotesque became a field of design um, that was extremely popular and also um, was meant to showcase the, the fantasia, the, the imaginative capacities of the artist, the generative capacities. And before long, we see um, that it's not just uh, things that were projected for projects on the wall, but also designs that began to be engraved and then circulated in print. Um, but, but 
you know, not everybody was a fan of this, this style of art. And in fact, right back to ancient Rome, not everybody was, was a fan of this type of art. And so Horace in his Ars Poetica, Poetica rather, um, spoke out against these, um, these idle fancies that he said were shaped like a sick man's dreams. The, you know, there's this idea that painters and poets had an artistic license and actually maybe even a calling to be imaginative and generative, but um, there were limits of decorum, limits of, of good taste on what should be done. And so um, this license that poets claim and we in turn grant to other like arts, for instance, painting, you know, that's, that's great and all, but we shouldn't show, you know, the savage mating with the tame or serpents coupling with birds or lambs or things that just are outside the, the realm of the plausible. This was something that was also um, uh, spoken out against um, or echoed really by Vitruvius, uh, the, um, the author of an important treatise on architecture that became a touchstone for um, architectural theory and design in the Renaissance. But here too, um, Vitruvius speaks out against the improper taste of the present times, his present being of course the Roman past, um, where monsters, um, rather than definite representations taken from definite things, uh, seem to be in vogue. And this I find interesting. So these new fashions, this fashion for the, gro well, what was the grotesque in ancient Rome, compel bad judges to condemn good craftsmanship for dullness, right? There's this kind of ever seeking for the novelty, things that um, excite the imagination and the eye, but may actually not reflect good craft practice, which for an architect is very important, right? You shouldn't have a column that actually is um, a, um, a flower stem because there's an architectonic mismatch there. Um, so pictures cannot be approved which do not resemble reality. It may not surprise you that within the theological debates of the 16th century, a similar type of um, condemnation of fantastical imagery also comes up precisely because, um, well, within a religious context, they're too distracting. Um, they, they distract the eye and the mind away from the good contemplation um, that should be sought on the law of God, but also what is the point? What do they signify, these ridiculous monsters? What's the meaning? I mean, these are ornamental forms, largely, and this is part of the, the kind of play with what is the status of ornament? Does it even need to have a meaning at all? Often it gains or produces its meaning in dialogue with the things that it is ornamenting, but on its own, um, you know, they're, they're touching on some of the kind of moral failings of this particular um, genre and style of art. All right, let's now talk about ornament prints. So I introduced the idea that um, novel designs were circulating widely by leading artists who were showing their um, inventive capacities. Um, and here we see a single sheet print that shows one design for a grotesque. But if the destination um, might be other artists, in fact, uh, we also see the rise of single sheet prints that have multiple variants, right? That might reflect something of workshop practice or the desire to kind of collate and, um, and then disseminate by print particular types of designs. Now, this is a, an example from 1515, but I also want to suggest that actually this was, uh, you know, already um, a practice in a much more playful context um, than something like, um, playing cards. So here's a gigantic blow up of what is a typically sized playing card, but this is the seven of cups, right? I mean, what you see here are seven different types of chalices elaborated. So even in a, a context of um, kind of, uh, you know, ludic early modern culture, you still have a, a really interesting um, opportunity to disseminate inventive designs on the part of the card uh, designer. Um, I bring this up also just because, you know, it's not just that these things circulated in print, of course, chunks of ornament of fragments um, from that are being dug up from around um, the, the continent, but largely in the Italian peninsula are getting drawn, they're being elaborated upon. And so there's this whole formal language of classical antiquity um, that uh, that is really being codified, but also developed upon at the individual level within um, a given workshop. And here's a beautiful <coughs> drawing, a study of a, an antique helmet with grotesque type designs. We see a, a hybrid, a, a sphinx here. Um, we see a, 
kind of satyr type figure, um, a mask. Of course, there's this entire um, dolphin lion hybrid type animal. Um, we have uh, leaf work, abundance of fruits. And you know, these, these were not just exercises in invention. In a lot of cases, these were meant to actually um, be studies towards actual objects or works of art, such as, <coughs> excuse me, such as the um, helmet that you see at right that resembles very closely the design um, on the left. Um, now, we saw a single sheet print. We saw a single sheet print with multiple um, variations upon it. There were also at this, right around 1540, you get the advent of actually issuing ornament designs in series um, in print. And so I'm showing you here uh, really four examples from um, a series of 11 plates by Aenea Vico. And again, these, these were circulating around. He wasn't the only one to be designing ewers or vases, um, nor was he the only one to actually be um, thinking about them in practical terms. And this is, I wanna start pushing us towards this idea that these are not just idle um, exercises in inventiveness. Um, and one of the reasons that I'm going to make that claim is because not only were ornament print designs issued as print series, but they began to, in some cases, have title pages to introduce them. Um, now, if we kind of zoom in on this one, and actually, let me just go back for a second. What you're looking at here is a what is truly a, a series of passion prints in which grotesque ornament designs actually come to inframe, they even encroach upon, they extrude um, narrative characters in the passion story. And so this is uh, one of the more kind of, in my mind, inventive and awesome, just plain out awesome um, ornament print uh, series. Uh, this was uh, done around 1580 by um, a Bruges artist who was working in Antwerp. Um, in any case, this title page is emblem-like in format. We've got a title up at the top uh, that tells us that this is the, the passion. Um, and we've got a kind of um, encapsulation here of the Arma Christi within a grotesque um, mode of um, arraying ornament. And then we have this really great text. And excuse the kind of rough roughness of the Latin. It was written by... Um, a Antwerp physician who fancied himself a Latinist, but he made things you know, unnecessarily complicated to the point of being ungrammatical. But um, so Sadler is the, um, the publisher of this series of prints. He may also be the uh, engraver. Um, that is, and so behold, viewer of Sadler as in Sadler's works of art, uh, foresee, I don't know why not just see, but foresee, <laughs> what is the learned hand which is to die on no day? The work is useful to the painter everywhere useful to the sculptor. It's useful for purple hangings. It's useful if you would bathe silver with shining gold, useful if it inscribes robes with ruddy purple. This is not the only um, title page to make claims like this. Um, here are just uh, an array of five more that have a central text. Sometimes they are bilingual texts, as in this one, as well as that one. And so they're trying to address a different audience. And since um, last fall, I have been, uh, with the help of um, a grant from the Glasscock Humanity Center at Texas A&M, um, I have been kind of combing through and amassing a database, transcribing, and eventually will make a kind of a digital resource for um, art historians and other researchers of these ornament print title pages, which have never really before been considered as a corpus. They've also, by uh, print scholars, been dismissed as just making empty claims because, um, you know, it's kind of a newish genre and it was a way to introduce things and maybe just sell some more prints. I disagree with that, <laughs> but in any case, so a cursory uh, examination of the, the ones that I've collected and transcribed so far point to um, three key characteristics. The first of which is that these title pages sought authority for their respective um, designs by gesturing towards concepts from ancient um, rhetorical uh, theory and contemporary art theory. Um, so notions such as abundance, they stress variety, they stress the novelty of the designs, the inventiveness um, and the utility. 
Second, they were repeatedly addressed to art lovers. So we see oftentimes a call out to liebhebbers or uh, liebhabers, um, lovers of antique ornament or a reader who understands art. You know, this is not necessarily an artist, but it's somebody who's um, a connoisseur or a, an, uh, an amateur. Uh, third, these title pages claim that the designs, let's go back to utility again, are useful for very specific artisans. Um, and here's the list that I've come across so far. So painters, glaziers and stained glass workers, printmakers, architects, masons, sculptors, that is sculptors of statuary, sculptors of images by which we mean plate cutters for making prints, sculptors of antique ornament, cabinet makers, reliquary makers, goldsmiths, silversmiths, glass makers, gem makers, jewelers, button makers, embroiderers, weavers, and makers of hanging textiles. All of these appear across the various series, sometimes called out in very unlikely combinations. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons why they've been overlooked, uh, because they don't seem likely to generate anything. But if there's a, something I've learned from the Making and Knowing project, it's to take the claims that appear seriously. And so um, the next phase of my project is starting to investigate what is the realm of the utility? What's the, the scope of the utility of these ornament prints? Um, how useful were they for these particular types of practicing artists? And I'll be inviting um, contemporary artists who work in historical modes of making or with historical techniques to actually interpret these prints, to look at them, to produce uh, reconstructions of them that are either actually ideally both um, as close as possible to the image, just to kind of bring out issues of tacit knowledge, issues of um, intermediary processes that might be necessary in order to get from a printed image to an actual object. Um, but I'll also be asking them to do something very free and inventive, because I think you know, there's the whole spectrum of utility here, but the, the actual nuts and bolts of it have not really been investigated. The last thing I should mention is that um, sometimes uh, these prints uh, call out classes of artists, so all artists or other artists, or sometimes in a list that may be exclusive to textiles, they'll say something like, and other artists of the like. Um, so this is the type of um, rhetoric we find on these title pages. All right, part four, material transformation. In this part of the talk, I want to kind of gesture towards what the, the artist's brief was, what they were intended to do. And I'm going to get into this question by considering the leading painter in Antwerp of the mid 16th century, and that is Franz Floris. Not just because he's the leading painter and he works in a classicizing mode, um, but also because his brother is Cornelis Floris, who is an eminent architect and sculptor, and he will figure in part five. So what you're looking at here is the house of Franz Floris, the brand new house. He purchased a, a lot of land, and we think in conjunction with his brother, again, who's an architect, they will have designed this house. And Franz is the one who uh, designed the facade decoration. So these are um, grisaille figures here in fictive niches. So they're just painted to look like statuary, but really it's a flat facade. And they depict the virtues and uh, kind of conceptual tools that a good artist might need. So they'll include things like a knowledge of architecture, a knowledge of poetry, labor, um, uh, utility, <laughs> and also, industry. And I'm pointing to the figure of industry here because her position actually over this set of doors is significant. That set of double doors was thought to actually lead to the back part of the property where Franz Floris also had constructed a large workshop. He, much like Raphael and a number of um, more successful Renaissance artists, had a whole team of um, young apprentices and journeymen working in his workshop. And so this door announced by industry leads back to the workshop. But I wanna also focus on what is on industry's head. And that is a depiction of an ambix. It is a piece of equipment that is used in distillation. So there's made very clear here that there's an idea of actually taking the knowledge of the artist um, and distilling it and, and points also towards issues of material transformation, um, as we might expect an artist to actually be engaged in. But I think here we have a really kind of um, pictorial articulation of that philosophy. And now, 
we also see similar ideas even in grotesque themselves. This is from um, the grotesques that are painted in the um, mathematics room of the um, Uffizi galleries in the later um, 16th century. And we see here somebody who's reading from a book who's distilling the information, which will then you know, lead to other further theoretical texts. Also notably, not just text, but here there's also, this is a, a Euclidean proof um, about Pythagorean, the Pythagorean theorem. But I think what I like about this is it stresses actually the um, importance of images for conveying technical knowledge in a way that we only see text in this particular book. And so I think this is part of the, the culture at the time and, and a part of a point that I wanna make shortly. Um, the material transformation was of course important to the genre of grotesque because again, it wasn't just about an exercise in design. It was about its application across a variety of media that we now tend to relegate to the, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know, the, the sandbox of the, the decorative arts. So things like, oh, I did what everybody else told me not to do. Let me just, oh, there we go. <laughs> um, the, uh, so lace making, for instance, and I'm not sure if you can make out up here, but these are the kind of split tails of a mermaid um, that is often a form you see elaborated in grotesques. Intarsia, um, tapestry, stained glass, painting. This is actually the, the, the headboard of a bed. Right? So all sorts of applications in everyday life. Um, so these, these forms were meant to be transformed into materials. And that's also thematized to a certain degree in the ornament prints themselves. I'm showing you here um, a plate from um, a series on um, kind of panoply of um, armaments and ornaments. And of course we see the ornaments and they're actually disposed in a format where they're, these are called trophies. So they, they're hung from strings and they collect all sorts of, in this case, um, you know, the um, gunpowder weaponry here, the kind of um, the a knight's armor and um, accoutrement, but also trophies were often elaborated to show artistic tools. And I'm saying this because I think the grotesque is actually a mode that is especially invested in notions of making. And we see this here with, uh, from left to right, the tools of the stoneworker, the woodworker, the metalworker, the painter, the gardener, and even the musician, right? So, and I'll just, just note this musician, um, this musical composition, because we see in the most virtuosic um, <laughs> instantiations, material instantiations of such a design, um, the, the kind of interest in mediating between this flat print and its ideas and the idea of how you might actually bring that to life in wood or uh, to life is probably a bit of a, an overstatement, but to actually um, instantiate it in, thank you, in, in an actual object. And I mean, that raises all sorts of technical questions, right? I mean, this is really virtuosic carving. You need a particular type of wood grain to be able to do that. You need particular tools. Um, and that was, though I'm showing you um, a very uh, wonderful piece by Grinling Gibbons of the late 17th century. This was also an, um, an issue right around the same time as we get that explosion in ornament print series. This is the mantelpiece of Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. Um, it's a commissioned by a political entity in Bruges to celebrate the emperor and his lineage. So we have his um, uh, maternal and um, paternal grandparents on either side, Ferdinand and Isabella on the one hand, and Maximilian and Mary of Burgundy on the other. It's a huge dynastic statement. But you can see that the whole thing is framed with um, grotesque ornament. And some of it is not just low relief that's actually on the panels like we see here. And here's one of those split tail merfolk. Um, but some of it is actually quite high relief. And this is carved in oak. And the designer of this uh, mantelpiece was so concerned that his designs actually be possible in oak, right? These really kind of high relief and delicate forms that he traveled from Bruges to Ghent to meet with the wood carvers in order to actually assure that his designs were plausible in material. So we know that this was a concern at the time. I'm gonna end here with a kind of speculative direction 
um, that I'm going now and the questions that I'm kind of putting on the table. I'm working with a founder, uh, well, a bronze sculptor named Andrew Lacey, who is not only interested in the technical investigation of works of historical bronze work, but he also um, is interested in the techniques and in reproducing them. Um, and I came to him with a variety of these ornament print title pages and, and uh, kind of uh, relevant ones that were calling out the sculptor or the goldsmith or metal workers and asked him to kind of make his way through. Is there anything from a practitioner's eye that could suggest that these things are actually useful in a way of conveying um, information about artistic practice? Um, he sees on this particular title page um, and this is from Cornelis Floris, this very famous sculptor architect from his first book of grotesque designs, where here he's a little vague. It's about, you know, for, it's for anybody who loves and uses art, um, but it's the first book. The second book published the second or the very next year gets a little bit more specific. And I think that this is um, actually much more just as germane to the first series, which is what we're going to deal with. Um, so here is that title page um, from the first series. And here are all the prints within it. And they're actually in order. Um, they have plate lettering, so A, B, C, D, E, so on and so forth. I'm hoping that even just a quick survey of this with your eye, you'll notice that there are two distinct families of forms in here. One is a spindly kind of um, ancient Roman style grotesque, precisely the thing that Vitruvius would have um, objected to because of the implausibility of the um, the support systems and the architectonics. And the other is a much, let's say, chunkier, weightier, um, very different style of engraving. It's almost like there are two series within one. And this second series, I think, is playing with this language of generation, hybridity, and monstrosity with which I began this talk. We have what is obviously phallic forms here on the left. We have nothing but men. And, and putti, small kind of children. But this side is entirely populated by men. We see hanging trophies here of um, phallic gourds. And you know that's not me being imaginative. Um, I'm gonna point out this detail here, a very famous instance of Raphael and his followers, you know, some 60 years earlier, um, making visual puns as this kind of gourd pushes its way into a ripe fig, right? So this is, you know, it's not just me. <laughs> um, and I want to argue maybe that, that this is the, the kind of female equivalent. This, this um, It is populated almost exclusively by women and puti, although we, have, we start getting kind of strange um, hybrid figures. This is the one more male figure who has the head of a lion. We start seeing things like um, snails and um, the types of animals that were thought to generate spontaneously. There's, but we also have, you know, the more conventional, um, she's literally reaching for these more conventional notions of fertility. And then it kind of gets really out of hand. Um, this is a kind of even pairing of male and female all the way up. Again, we have, um, you know, shells are references to um, uh, aphrodisiacs but, and to, um, to fertility, but also there's still these uh, kind of intermediary you know, snails as um, also uh, stand-ins for um, female anatomy. And then here we have something that's much more even transgressive. The, the coupling that's taking place is actually between two women. Um, we have something that's in a very clear marshland um, and the marsh too being kind of, at least in the low countries where this is coming out of, often saw an intermingling of, of salt and fresh water. So this is a really kind of, um, it's thematizing issues of generation, of hybridity, of coupling, of um, composite animals, uh, composite forms. And that returns us to the point of this. Andrew seized on these little details right here. And he noticed that this figure was also poking through a circular form and the hand was coming out, which suggests that this strap work is hollow. If this is meant to be useful for metal workers, if he were to cast this in bronze, there's an advantage to casting lightly and um, in hollow forms. And that these might be indications of joints and that this opening might allow you to then actually um, inject in molten metal to help with fusing things in a, in a composite 
um, style or in a composite um, form that's much larger than these kind of indications or these um, starting points. And here are two competing notions of how you might approach the task of casting a wellhead. These are in the courtyard of the Doge's Palace in Venice. On the left was cast by the Di Conti family in one piece. And I hope you can see that that casting is kind of rough um, by comparison to this. The Albergati family failed at doing a, um, a single piece casting. And what they ended up coming to as a solution in the end were 24 individual pieces that were then fitted together. So here you have kind of a, basically a treat as a visual and material treat is in two different casting techniques. But the question is how do you get those 24 pieces together in ways that are um, satisfying, that can hold water, but also that are not, um, kind of smoke and mirrors ways of distracting from a really poor scene, which is what you most often see. There might be an interesting visual passage that then distracts from a less well-finished um, form. This is the Tabernacle by Cornelius Floris, the guy who does the print series. It thins out Leu. And if you've ever been to the VNA, there's a plaster cast of the whole thing. But what I'm interested in is actually the brass enclosure down here. Um, because that brass enclosure, and I just want to point out this form right here is what we're going to zoom in on, which is about five feet uh, wide. And here we see the same type of formal vocabulary um, that we saw in the grotesque ornament prints. But this, if this was cast in one piece, this is virtuosic brass casting. What's more likely, Andrew thinks, is that it was done in pieces and that it may be making use of some of this ingenious um, kind of casting techniques that he thinks he sees hinted at. And so our next, um, our next step in this inquiry is to see whether or not um, to get closer to these objects to see exactly how they were made. And I'll just make a, a contrast here. So I want you to pay attention to these little lunettes here above this choir screen, because here we see the casting technique in situ. We've got Puti, they touch a candelabra, their wings, their little sprues here, little kind of decorative ribbons. But what that should remind you of, if you remember Pamela's talk from yesterday, is the casting infrastructure, right? In some ways, this is laying bare for you the fact that the technique um, is, um, is a single piece of casting. Um, and some of that has been you know, lost along the way, but the, the pieces were originally there. And these lunettes are only about a foot wide compared to the five foot wide piece here. And so if there's joinery here, remember this is also the, the, the more sacred side of this is the backside, right? So it's not like there's gonna be a bunch of seams on the back that are unseemly or... Um, so I wanna end by on this slide by kind of bringing the, the topic around again of the grotesque ornament print as a site for, um, or that's pulling in some of the, the ideas circulating in biological um, uh, natural history at the time that are indexing questions around generation, fertility, hybridity, at the same time that I think these prints are also um, types of uh, treatises on making that are calling out specific artists and that a material hands-on investigation through reconstruction and actually handling of these materials will, will help us um, bridge that gap. Thanks. That was great. Um, I'm I'm wondering about the places in some of the prints where, especially some of the florist prints, where the kind of inanimate or seemingly inanimate structures are biomorph are themselves biomorphic. So where the strap work becomes something that's that's kind of organic and um, and how so yes yeah exactly so um, so where's, where there's a kind of ambiguity of animacy versus inanimacy mm -hmm. um, and how that could translate into other materials so um, because there's something you know there's something about the the um, monochrome medium that allows for maybe greater ambiguity than certainly than if you had to translate this into painting where then some decisions would have to be made about what you know which parts are animate which parts are inanimate is the 
is you know the the water is as that water seems to you know is the water flowing upwards or downwards and is that water or is it you know turning into something solid and all the all the different kinds of transformations that that you could imagine are 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 going on so like when something like this gets translated into wood or metal or um some other kind of material how um are, are there you know I, I, i'm just curious about whether whether there are techniques that craftsmen use to retain the ambiguity if there's ambiguity or um or 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 whether there are moments where you can see that a decision has been made that that loses some of the ambiguity that's present in the print that's a great question and i mean it's it's premised on the idea that actually this would be one-to-one -one kind of instantiated i mean if it were instantiated entirely in metal some of that you know ambiguity with any kind of single medium but i i actually wonder and this is very speculative and i don't yet i can't yet back this up so if anybody has ideas about how i might go about that i'm all ears but I actually wonder if these four prints are really trying to say something more about um, again, hinting towards workshop techniques that might be useful to the sculptor more than they are actually being um, examples of objects. And I say that because I think of um, uh, the manuscript that we studied in the Making and Knowing project and this um, uh, on a entry for grottos, there was um, a suggestion that you take um, that you actually use nitric acid to remove some of the um, exterior layers from shells in order to reveal the mother of pearl. I mean, we left it in a, a kind of weak nitric acid bath for way too long. And what happens is that they actually become pliable, right? Like it almost starts to disintegrate. And I think about this kind of, you know, this, this form on the left, which to me in some ways, like I, I want to see this as um, kind of a, it has echoes of both the, the kind of male and female um, forms overlaid, whether that's the uterine form and then, but also the, the phallic form that we've seen in the first series of prints. And so part of me thinks that it's, it could just be about generation, but also hints for those who know. And this is precisely Andrew's point in his conversation with me and also what we know from the Making and Knowing Project and our, our discussions of artisanal texts and um, texts that convey practical knowledge. Who are they for? Because they're not for, um, you know, the general reading audience. You're not going to pick up a book on, you know, uh, mining and somehow know now how, how to go extract minerals. It's in some ways, it's about a conversation between people who have a baseline knowledge. And so part of what I'm, I'm, I'm intuiting here, but again, I could be wrong, is that these are meant to actually be much more associative and generative for thinking about artisanal processes or maybe indexing them or giving hints towards things, but there's a kind of level of, um, in induction in that community that's already premised here. Uh, thanks, yeah, that's terrific. Um, I'm wondering, I'm thinking back to the, the old Horst Bredekamp book about the cult of antiquity and the lure of the machine. I'm probably getting the title slightly wrong. But is it the other way around? Sorry. Anyway, um, I was sort of expecting a story here about actual simulated grottos in uh, the gardens of the rich and famous and so on and so forth. And uh, the position of machine technologies and books of machines and so on and so forth. And I'm wondering if maybe something of the printerliness, the production, the use of the printing press as a machine might um, speak to that larger narrative. And I guess I'm just wondering if you could help us to position how you see the particular nexus of mechanization and uh, reimagining of the antique that Breda Camp presented and how your story is either uh, critiquing that or um, departing from it in any way. I mean, I think my, my story is focused on the idea that these are not necessarily literal encodings in the sense of like uh, a rebus that needs to be read um, and can be read very clearly, um, except maybe uh, what I, I mean, what I wanna see here are um, indications of 
potential solutions for those in the know for um, meeting the sculptor's task of actually making, you know, whether it's colossi, like, you know, that Cellini writes about, or um, kind of techniques that, that, that sculptors know, or that if they don't know in just seeing this, which was the case with Andrew, um, that they might actually have an, an idea of how to go about, um, so that the, the reimagining of the antique here is riffing on the idea of um, the kind of intellectual fantasy exercise of taking these and, you know, developing your own um, vocabulary, or even depictions of, of monstrous hybrids or grotesque out of um, some kind of inspirational source material, and that there's a technical art making um, analogy here that uh, that these prints might serve. And, you know, it's not as though, so I'm, I'm kind of focusing on this case study on Cornelius Floriste, but I mean, we know this already from things like the, um, the pattern books of embroidery, right? That there are ways of laying out those images that are very specific to the way um, embroiderers or lace makers work. And so I don't, or what I'm trying to find is, is indications that there's analogous type of material thinking in um, these prints in the way that they are presenting the information that they have. So it's a, it's a reimagining of antiquity that really is less about antiquity, except insofar as it's referencing that same kind of generative uh, vocabulary, if only to prompt you to actually take it and run further with it rather than just, you know, thinking of yet another combination of a wild beast, but actually what can be generated out of it for these particular practicing artists that are indexed. And to me, I think that's the, um, that's the point of departure. All right, can I? Yeah. Um, so thank you, Tiana. That was, as all of your papers are, lapidary in its <laughs> argumentation. <laughs> that was great. Um, and speaking of lapidary, I think that, um, you know, these were of interest to goldsmiths as well, to any metal worker, really. And goldsmiths used, it's a little known fact that goldsmiths actually were masters of assemblage, mm -hmm. that is, of joining things together with, you know, purpose-made screws and purpose-made screwdrivers. I mean, it's a it's an area of making which has just not been examined at all. Um, but anyway, so I think that it's important to look at those um, at the goldsmiths assemblages for one thing. Um, but the bigger point that I want to make is that these prints are designed to appeal to many audiences, mm -hmm. just like those recipe books, just like all of those ma how to manuals. And I think that points us to, um, you know, just the power of art that is being celebrated, that is art as human making, the power of art that's being celebrated, both in the how-to books, but also in prints like this, you know, mm -hmm. the inventiveness, the utility, the abundance, the, the generative quality and, and um, potential of them all. And I really think that that shows us that art has a power at this time that is of interest to so many levels of society and different people that science plays that role today. I mean, that that is, that really is the connecting tissue here, I think. I mean, for the purposes of this, this conference, that um, this kind of, you know, relevance of human generation and artistic generation, you know, is relevant to the kind of human interest in hum humans as the endpoint of scientific investigation, um, as well as the kind of technological virtuosity that goes on in science today. So it's, you know, this is the science of the day. It's not the content of natural philosophy or natural history. I mean, that's also relevant, but this in terms of its promise for the future, promise for humanity is the science of today. Just kind of as, as you're thinking about these as practical, as, as containing practical advice for for craft what about this what about the implausibility like what about like Vitruvius saying you know you can't stack a 
you, you know, a figure on a, on a slender stalk. I think, and, and this kind of goes along with the idea of like what the, what's, how what doesn't seem possible in one moment can become possible later. So, so what it seems like some, there's some important component here of the impossible and not the possible, but something that, I mean, maybe it might become possible in, in some future moment, but that, that they're also, they're not, I mean, I don't think you're, I don't think you're saying that they are mm -hmm. only practical advice to craftsmen, mm -hmm. but how do you think about the relationship between those two things of the, of the, the possible and the impossible as they're combining in some of these images? I mean, I think that's part of the, that's part of the appeal, even if we think about Kunstkammer um, and Wunderkammer objects, right, is actually the, the implausibility of the pairing sometimes. And I think, I think that's, you're, you're hitting on a really important point that, that is um, kind of a, subtext to some of these images. Uh, I don't know that, you know, I, I wonder also about, I mean, this is one particular print series that we're focusing on, but you, know, you can see um, in not this image, but the one that was right after it, um, where you have kind of indications of how you might actually join this up to make maybe a three-dimensional pergola or something, right? That um, there are kind of gestures towards um, other types of assemblage. And the question is one of scale, which it always is with art and especially with prints too, at what scale can you possibly um, instantiate this? So some of the, the plausibility really depends on the, the destination media and what gets done with it. But I think um, that, <coughs> excuse me, it's a tickle in my throat. Um, I think that play at, at a variety of levels of scale is actually one of the, the most interesting um, or potentially fertile um, <laughs> areas of, of kind of experiment with uh, some of the practicing artists as we as we try to make material instantiations. What what can be done? What needs to be done to actually turn this into something that is plausible? If you want to have something that even appears implausible, but still may be, um, you know, uh, something that's in your garden, um, a kind of latticework structure. Um, where does the the stability actually get hidden? And so. I want to treat these prints as though they are the visual analogs of recipes, or as though they might even be suggested to me, and I think this is generative, um, they might be related to the kind of theater of machines, right? That you have these exploded views on little pieces of artistic practice that if you have the knowledge of how to play with them, you can do something more. But the issue is, what's the knowledge you need to have to make that recognition? And what's the technical skill that you need to have to be able to adapt those into actual objects? And it's those intermediary steps and that kind of question of the tacit knowledge that I'm really, I'm, I'm eager to kind of see if we can get closer to. And, you know, it's the pro I mean, it's the implausibility of that, which then, you know, is possible. You know, to the, to the slide before. Sure. I mean, both the one that you described on the prior slide and these two are like sections of a three-dimensional object. And these even show how you connect one piece to the next if you look at the, mm -hmm. the holes in one or the posts in another. And, and I think what's really interesting about this in, in relationship to some of the other um, discussion is that if you imagine the three dimensionality of this, now what we're seeing is hidden. Mm. And the slicing open is revealing both the, 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 the grotesque, mm. it, it, the investigation of the grotesque, but also the investigation of the object. And it's like the secret, you know, sacred interior to the Congo figure mm. or the, you know, Herman and uh, and your discussion about you know what what happens behind closed doors and when do, when does when does science reveal what it's investigating? That's so a really I, nice. So point. I, this is very interesting the, the, the way they all kind of interconnect. Thank you for that observation. That's 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 wonderful. Thank you. Not much watching time, but um, yes, hooking on to the notion of secrecy in this one, just fabulous material. Thank you so much, Tiana. And you have triggered so much. Maybe I just suggested two things. I think what underlies these four prints we seem to keep coming back to is on this metamorphosis, because I see this and the other one as among the other things that are being inventively played with are different themes from the metamorphosis. Callisto in Vienna, for example, which is a 
same sex kind of story that Rebecca has written about. Um, the chariot, the dolphins, the water, all of these I would have triggered in that community for whom they were made some semblance of knowledge of what all those stories were. So all its metamorphosis and its circulation, I think, is here. A second point that takes us back is this is all rhetoric. Your um, forwards or uh, the frontispieces pieces of the book, that's example, perfect example of high style rhetoric, which takes us back to medieval techniques of rhetoric. And I don't, you know, the work of Mary Carruthers, mm -hmm. who writes a lot about the way in which rhetoric in the Middle Ages, it's based on, you suggested that invention, elocution, presentation, and also its function is to help remembrance. Mm -hmm. So by organizing and presenting things in a certain way, you kind of inculcate their absorption. And that's obviously primary in something of this sort. Um, I was going to show diagram, medieval diagrams of rhetoric, and maybe at the end, I'll come back a little bit more to that. But rhetoric, I think, is um, the art, the skill, the technique that's underlying this kind of visual production. Franz Flores was someone I, whose slide I deleted yesterday. He's, he has a wonderful painting of um, an artist, St. Luke, with a big pigment grinder next to him. I mean, somebody's doing all the operations. And again, I was reminded today of the brothers, architect and painter, big time in their communities. And then in the 15th century, Antonio Polaiuolo and Piero, again, metal worker and painter, architect and painter. And to go back a little bit more, Jan van Eyck, it's thought that this brother of his, Hubert, was the one who had made the frame for that great altarpiece. So one, one again, would again not just have had a, um, a studio of a lot of painters and second-rate painters and third-rate painters, but a collaboration of multi-skilled artists. Mm -hmm. Last little point, that quote, wonderful long quote from Milanus Molena, so I don't know, that's literally from Bernard of Clairvaux in about 1130. I'm, and I'm, I'm fascinated by it to discover that would have been known and then circulated somehow in print mm -hmm. in what, the 16th century? The 16th century, yeah. And Pelliotti too, who dedicates, I think, like six chapters to the grotesque. Yeah, but and... It's literally out of a letter he writes that's quite celebrated among medievalists in um, 1130 or 1128 or something. And that, thank you so much. For uh, that. Thank you. I, I want to just respond very quickly to the, the notion of rhetoric. And the thing that I, I neglected to mention was, you know, I named those authors who kind of reviled or were suspicious of the kind of moral or even aesthetic value architectonic value of the grotesque. But of course, ornament was a really important part of rhetoric, right? And that's right through Quintilian and Cicero. I mean, the, you know, the, the judicious use of it was really, so there's this tension in the 16th century between um, good and um, bad, for lack of a subtler binary ornament. Thank you very much. much. Um, <laughs> Now we have a 15 minute break, correct?